This is uh, the first chapter for uh, Weld 1760. Uh, it's chapter 12 from your textbook, Shielded Metal Arc Welding Electrodes. Um, basically, this is the identification of, of welding electrodes. As you know from our previous classes, you'll be, you are working with 6010, 7018, and 7024. Uh, this chapter tells you all about the electrodes. What do those numbers mean? I've probably by this time spoken with each of you individually in the, in the classroom about those numbers and some, something about the, uh, uh, how they're made up and how they're consumed and so forth. But this chapter is going to get into a lot of detail about that. Um, so if you look on page 345, it says uh, under introduction, shielded metal arc welding, SMAW, often referred to by welders in the field as stick electrode welding, that's an improper name, don't use that name, uh, is one of the most widely used welding processes in the fabrication and repair of metals. Uh, this popularity has resulted from the development of flux-covered electrodes capable of making welds having physical properties that are equal or superior to the material being welded. Now we're on page 345, but I'd like you to take, a, take note of this. This is also in your course outline, or your, rather your study guide. These are the pages out of this chapter that you're going to be concerned with for Weld 1760. The missing pages, uh, 368 through 376, those pertain to Weld 1950, which is stainless steel. Uh, uh, feel free to read through those if you like. Uh, you're more than welcome to. But for the purposes of this test and this lecture, these are the pages that we're going to cover. So go ahead and flip the page. Um, picking up at the top of the page on 346, it says, It is, of course, your objective to be able to posit welds that have the most desirable physical and chemical properties, soundness, and appearance that the electrodes are capable of giving. Study figure 12.1 carefully. Learn to recognize good and bad welds and to understand the factors involved in good and bad welds. After you are thoroughly familiar with the characteristics of the electrodes discussed in this chapter, you should consult the catalogs or electrode suppliers and the materials available from the American Welding Society for information on other types of electrodes, such as those for high tensile steel, alloy steels, non-ferrous materials, and surfacing materials. If you look at those pictures, the, all the pictures down on the bottom are, of course, overheads of, of different types of, of uh, weld beads that have been run. Some of them are good, some of them aren't so good. And if you look above, you see a profile of the same ones. A, for example, is the welding current is too low. Uh, you can see it's a high, rounded uh, appearance. Welding current too high, you can see uh, uh, on B, it's been spread out. Usually there's a lot of spatter associated with that type of a weld. So go ahead and read across that so you can learn to recognize a good weld from a bad weld and what caused that weld to be bad. Of course, you're going to get a lot more of that by working with Jeff Brager and I in, in the welding lab. Uh, weld 1760 is vertical up and overhead. If you remember from our previous lecture, that would, that would be 3F, the 3F position, and the 4F position. Vertical and overhead. Now when you're talking about the vertical position, you also have to talk about the weld progression. Is it up or is it down? Vertical up is what you're learning in this class. We're starting at the bottom of the plate and we're welding up as opposed to starting at the top and welding down. So whenever you're talking about the vertical position, you always have to put that in there and designate was the welding up or was the welding down. Some of the discontinuities or defects that you could encounter in welding vertical up or overhead are uh, undercut, uh, excessive roundness, um, spatter, Magnetic arc blow, especially when you get near the top of those T-joints. Uh, and there's a, there are certain causes. For example, you may, in the overhead position, without realizing it, you'll, you'll, you'll allow that electrode to burn away from that plate. And by allowing it to burn away, you're going to get more metal going to one plate than the other, so you'll have unequal legs. These are all problems that are associated with vertical up and overhead. Uh, you're going to learn more about those as Jeff and I work with you one-on-one -on -one in the, in the uh, welding booths. Read about shielded metal arc welding electrodes uh, on that page. It, basically, this is a definition 
uh, of what they are, and it comes out of uh, the American Welding Society's standard terms and definitions. That's a, that's a, a, a publication titled A3.0, and I have that if anybody would like to look at that. Over on the next page, it says introduction to covered electrodes. The type of covering on these electrodes influences the degree of penetration of the arc and the crater depth. Uh, the proper electrode selection, therefore, makes it possible to obtain sound welds in close-fitting joints and to avoid burning through poorly fitted joints. Since the covering influences the extent of penetration, it affects the, the extent of recrystallization and annealing previous, uh, previously deposited beads. Annealing, of course, is a heat treatment process. So if, if, if you, we put in one weld bead and then we put another one on top of it, we're going to be remelting or recrystallizing that first, that first bead that we put in there. But also that heat is going to anneal that first bead in, in, a, in a manner. And that's what they're talking about here. Um, this characteristic improves the internal quality of the weld. And you know, notice, notice they put, it, put radiographic in parentheses there. As we go along and you get up into the, the higher welding classes that we offer, we will x-ray or radiograph some of your work. Uh, the low electrical conductivity of the covering permits the use of electrodes in narrow grooves. Because they're covered, electrodes are covered with, with flux, if you happen to touch them against the side of a piece of steel, then it's not going to ground out on you. That covering protects it, and that's what they're talking about there. The covering also reduces weld spatter. Uh, and as by, by now, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that 6010 creates a lot more spatter than 7018. And in 7024, uh, if it, as long as it's not influenced by arc blow, creates even less. Uh, functions of the electrode covering. There's a, a lot of functions. Uh, there's five main ones. But let's read these bulleted items here. It says, it acts as a scavenger in removing oxides and impurities. Oh, the, pardon me. They're talking about the slag. When you strike the arc and you run that bead, of course, uh, the material on the electrode is being consumed, it's being burnt up, creates a gaseous shield. That's its one, one of its most important facts. Uh, creates that gaseous shield. It can add alloying elements to the base metal. Um, it's got oxidizers in there that will help to keep uh, porosity from, from being created. Um, and it has stabilizers in there to give it better arc characteristics. But what they're talking about right here is the slag covering. When that slag solidifies on top of the weld metal, what does it do? Well, it acts as a scavenger in removing oxides and impurities. It slows down the freezing rate of the molten metal. It slows down the cooling rate of the solidified metal. And it controls the shape and appearance of the deposit. It affects operating characteristics, uh, DC electrode positive, alternating current, etc. cetera. Uh, next topic, alteration or restoration of base metal. It says, to a large extent, the covering, the, uh, the flux covering on the electrode controls the composition of the weld metal, either by maintaining the original composition of the core wire or the, of the electrode or through the introduction of additional elements. What they mean is every one of these electrodes, of course, has got a core wire, and then that flux is put on the outside of it. That core wire has a certain chemical composition to it. And somewhere in here, Look on page 349, table 12-2. Comparison of core wire composition, filler metal, and covered electrodes. You'll see that these core wires, they all have carbon, manganese, silicone, sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, and nitrogen. That's all part of that hard metal. And basically, they're going to have some variation of that, but they're all going to be pretty close to the same. Well, say we wanted to, to make a stainless steel here. Well, then we would add chromium to that. So we put some alloying elements in the flux. And they can do that with a lot of different things. They can put all kinds of different alloying elements in that flux. But that core wire is going to be basically the same. So that's what they're talking about here. They can put additional elements into that, into that flux to create different properties. Drop down a little bit, and it says, the addition of large amounts of iron powder to the coating of an electrode increases the speed of welding and improves the weld appearance. Uh, a lot of welding rods have iron powder in it. Of course, you can't see the iron powder. Uh, it might discolor it a little bit. But what happens with that iron powder is it is melted in, in the welding arc and becomes part of the weld metal. 7018, for example, has about 25% iron powder in it. Um, 7024, on the other hand, is 50% iron powder. You can see the difference in the color of it 
but also uh, uh, that, that color is caused by the, by the iron powder that is put in there. So th that's just one example of, of what they can put into that flux. Uh, next paragraph reads, low hydrogen electrodes greatly improve the welding of high carbon and alloy steels, high sulfur steels, and phosphorus bearing steels. Such steels tend to be porous and crack under heat, under the bead. The reduction of hydrogen con content in the weld eliminates these harmful characteristics. Um, hydrogen, of course, is the most abundant element in the universe. It has an affinity for the, for the liquid weld puddle. It's going to try to get into that. It's, going to, it's like a sponge. It wants to absorb it. Uh, low hydrogen electrodes uh, help to stop that. I, I, if hydrogen gets into that weld pool, it can cause what's, up, what's called under bead cracking. Uh, that's where two molecules of, uh, of hydrogen join together, pardon me, two atoms of hydrogen join together, together to form a molecule. And then it, it's too big to nestle between the grain boundaries, and so it exerts pressure on those grain boundaries, which can lead to cracking. But the one that you'll probably see is porosity. That's another thing that hydrogen in the weld metal will do, will cause porosity, or little bubbles. And I'm sure by this point, if, you, if you've all taken weld 1755, you're familiar with what porosity is. Control of arc characteristics, drop down to the second paragraph. It says, as a rule, when welding with SMAW electrode, the maximum arc length is never greater than the diameter of the bare end of the electrode. So if, if this pencil were a welded electrode and the lead were the bare wire, that means I don't want to hold it any farther away than that diameter. So typically, you just want to keep in mind, keep a short arc, arc length. Materials for covering electrodes? Well, what do they do? There's fluxes, deoxidizers, slagging ingredients, alloying ingredients, gas reducers, binders, arc stabilizers, shielding gases. All of these things are, are, are created by the coverings. And it says sodium and potassium silicates are universally used as binders. Some organic gums also have a limited use for this purpose. Ferro alloys and pure metals serve as deoxidizers and alloying ingredients. The alkaline earth metals are the best arc stabilizers. Wood flour, wood pulp, refined cellulose, cotton linters, starch, sugar, and other organic materials provide a shield of reducing gases. Fluxes and slagging ingredients include silica, alumina, clay, iron, ore, rutile, limestone, magnesite, mica, and many other materials, as well as some man-made materials such as potassium titanate and titanium dioxide. So these are all some of the materials that could be in those covering. Um, here, it talked about cellulose. Well, 6010 is a sodium cellulose electrode, but we'll get into that a little bit more later on. Dropping down where it says polarity interchangeability, tables 12.1 through 12.3 demonstrate the important function of the covering and its direct effect on the chemical and physical properties of the weld. Uh, study carefully the properties of the various types of electrodes described on the following pages and in table 12.4. It will also be beneficial at the same time to become familiar with the current values in table 12.5. So if you look at 12.1, it says physical properties of welds and covered electrodes. And by the physical properties, they're, of course, talking about its tensile strength, its yield strength, uh, its impact resistance, all the mechanical, physical properties that the weld metal has. And you can see that uh, typically what we're going to see is 60 to 75,000 pounds of tensile strength, a yield strength or a yield point of 45 to 60,000 pounds, percent elongation, which if you took 1755, then I, uh, you know, I've already talked about that some. Uh, impact, strength, and so forth. Table 12.2 talks about the comparison of core wire compositions, filler metal and covered electrodes. And as I've already mentioned, they have carbon, manganese, silicone, sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, and nitrogen. Um, the most important element in these things is the carbon content. If you look at carbon, it's got one-tenth of one percent to uh, 0 0.15 of one percent. That makes it a low carbon uh, electrode, uh, and it's used on mild steel, what we call mild steel. You have mild steel, you have medium steel, and you have high carbon steel. But all of those carbons still don't get you up more than about uh, 0.40 carbon content. If you get any higher than that, you start to get into a, a cracking situation, and you have to be very careful and do what they call stress relieving. Uh, it's a heat treat process to keep from, from cracking. Uh, but it's a funny thing. You can, you can take all of these different percentages here, and there's a formula that you can use that can, you can calculate what they call a carbon equivalency. Uh, 
And even though it's not all carbon, uh, manganese, silicone, sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, nitrogen, they, they can all add up to an equivalent carbon content. It's not carbon, but in terms of the necessity of having a heat treat afterwards or not, you calculate those out and see if it exceeds 0 0.40. If it does, then you may have to uh, change your welding procedure. Table 12.3, weld metal properties afforded by the types of covered electrodes. Um, the property number, you have E6010, which is what we're welding with. It has a tensile strength of 62,000 pounds, a yield point of 50,000 pounds, and a percent of elongation of 17 to 25 percent. I wanted to draw your attention to this because go all the way down to e 120 X. Let's say you had an e 120 18 Okay, well, we're welding with 7018. 120 simply means that it's 120,000 pound tensile strength, and if you look there, you can see it says 120,000 pound tensile strength. There is a direct relationship between tensile strength and its yield strength, and therefore its uh, percentage of elongation. If you take 6010, it's got a yield point or a yield, uh, yield strength of 50,000 psi, and it can have up to 25% elongation. Uh, 100, uh, e 120 x however, it has a yield point of 107,000, but it only has a, a percent of elongation of 14. That's because it's more brittle. The strong, it's, it's increased in strength, but it's been reduced in its ability to stretch without breaking, so it's become more brittle. And, and there's a direct relationship, and you can see it there. The, the higher the tensile strength, the lower the percent of elongation, or the more brittle the material becomes. Okay, reading under AWS classifications for carbon steel electrodes, drop down to the paragraph uh, below the, all those bulleted items, and it says the various electrodes are classified with a system of numbers and organized on the basis of the mechanical properties of the deposited weld metal, type of covering, recommended welding position of the electrode, and type of current required for best results. Compare the various characteristics of carbon steel electrodes in tables 12.3 and 12.4, on pages 349 to 350. Uh, this is a bulleted item. The numbering system provides a series of four or five digit numbers prefixed by the letter E. The letter E stands for electrode. Uh, the first two digits, uh, it could be the first three digits of a five digit number, talks about the tensile strength. Let me write this on the board. It's harder for me to read it out of the book and try to follow that than it is to just tell you. Follow along in your book. E means electrode, okay? We're working with 7018 and 6010, and I just mentioned you could have 120. All these numbers count for the tensile strength of the base metal, that bare metal, okay? Followed by, it could be a one, or it could be a two, or it could be a four. We're using 7024 rod, aren't we? Okay? This, this digit tells you what positions that welding electrode was designed to be used in. And then finally, we have an 8 and a 0, and let's say another 8, uh, 70, 24, or 4. This last digit tells you something about that flux coating and the electrical characteristics. Was it designed to be, be run with AC electricity? Or was it designed to be run with DC electricity, electrode positive, DC electricity, electrode negative? Now, I don't expect you to remember all that, to memorize all of that, but you have to know that that is what it means, and you can go to a reference and look it up. Now, chemical characteristics and electrical, right? Okay, so the zero means this is, a, as I've already mentioned, 6010 has a sodium cellulose coating. 7018 has a lot of lime in it. That's what gives it that... Uh, uh, that uh, low hydrogen ability. Uh, 12018 is the same thing. It's only got a higher carbon content, so they put more, put more carbon in it, raise, increasing the tensile strength of it. 7024, the 4 tells you that it's an iron powder rod. If you remember, I mentioned earlier that it has up to 50% iron powder in it. So you know this is an iron powder, this is a low hydrogen lime, this is a sodium cellulose. That's what that last digit means. So E for electrode, 7018, E6010, E12018, E7024. Okay? It's pretty simple. Know it because you are going to have to explain what all this means. It will be on your test. Okay.
One other thing now, if you look at, at uh, figure 12-3A and 12-3B, you'll see some numbers coming after that. Well, these numbers that come after it are, are suffixes, and I'm going to use 7018 as an example. You could have 7018-A1. That simply means that it's got a little molly or molybdenum in it. It could be 7018-B3, okay? That's a suffix, which means it's got, I believe this is two and a quarter chrome in it. So they take the basic low hydrogen electrode, but then, okay, they're going to weld up uh, the outside wall of, of a power plant, so it's going to be exposed to a lot of heat, so they want to improve its, its heat resistance, so they'll add a little chrome, so it, it can better cope with the heat of that furnace. And that suffix then is B3. And you can, you can look that up. There's charts where you can look that up and see what's actually in there. It will change the, the welding characteristics only slightly, probably so slightly that you won't even be aware of it. Okay? But know that if it has a suffix, it's, this is what it's telling you. There's something else added to it besides just the basic rod. Okay, table 12.5 at the top there, uh, again, and these are current ranges that they suggest. We've got them uh, posted up on our board, bulletin board in there. Uh, also on table 12.4, I've highlighted in my book E6010, E7024, and E7018. And that will tell you what they're made out of, tell you what positions they're designed to be welded in, tell you what electrical characteristics they can be used with, tell you the depth of penetration and how fast can it be welded, what, kind of, what does the bead look like, and so forth. So highlight that in your book. Familiarize yourself with that. Okay. Flipping the page, put a bullet by the paragraph which reads, it is important to understand that many, many electrode classifications contain the same basic core wire. And I talked about that previously. The difference in operating characteristics and in the physical and mechanical nature of the deposited weld metals are mostly determined by the materials in the covering. So again, that, that flux coating is what gives you all those alloying elements. That's what makes the difference in that base metal. That base metal is all the same. We could strip it off Strip that flux off of there, and those two pieces of core wire would be just the same. But when we put that flux on there, we're creating different electrical characteristics, different properties. Uh, you are urged to study carefully the characteristics of the basic welding electrodes described in this section. A thorough knowledge will assist you not only in acquiring the technical knowledge necessary to choose the proper electrode for a given job, but also in mastering the manipulative techniques of the welding operation. As we have seen, there is a large number of electrodes that can be selected. In order to reduce the number of tests the welder has to take to become qualified, in parentheses it says certified, you're, you're a qualified welder when you become certified, many codes group together uh, uh, welding electrodes rather than on, uh, on their ease of welding rather than on mechanical properties. One such grouping is from, and I want you to highlight this, AWS D1.1 structural welding code steel. It says C table 12-8. Highlight this, if any of the electrodes in the more difficult F4 grouping is used on the welder qualification test, a welder who passes the test will be qualified on all the electrodes in this group, as well as all the lesser groups. Now look at table 12.8, top of the book, and it has those listed. It has four groups, F1, F2, F3, and F4. And if you look at that, we have EXX20 in the F1, XX20, EXX24. Now, from what we just talked about over here, you know that these two Xs could be replaced by 70. So now this suddenly becomes electrode 7024. So we know that it's a, an F1. It comes from the F1 group. Therefore, they're saying that 7024 is going to be easier to weld than some of these other ones. Let's take a look at F3, okay? We have E, X, X, one, zero, E, X, X, what is that? Uh, X, 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 one. So here, of course, we could substitute six, zero and have E, 6010, 
Pardon me, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. These should come down here. So 6010 then, from our chart, you can tell is an F3. So if you can weld with 6010, AWS says you can weld with 7024. And then finally, we have EXX18. So again, substituting 70 for the Xs, E7018 is an F4 rod. If you can weld with E7018, the code says you can also weld with 6010 and 7024. Okay? The higher the number, the harder it's considered to be welded, and you're qualified for all everything underneath it. Okay. Size of electrodes, uh, what determines that? Well, it's given us some bulleted items. Joint design, the material thickness, the thickness of the weld layers. Most codes will not allow you, in fact, I've never come across one, uh, that lets you deposit a single weld bead greater than one half of an inch thick. That's a lot of metal, one half of an inch thick. I've welded, the biggest welding rod I've ever welded with was about that long. Well, I take that back. It's about that long, about two feet long, and was one quarter of an inch thick. That's pretty thick. Uh, but even with that, I never got close to a half inch. It all depends on how, how fast you're running and how, how high that amperage is set up to determine how fast that thing's going to burn off, what that rate of de deposition is going to be. Uh, but they, they put that in there because they don't want you to weld, to try to weld with any more than that because you're going to be dumping too much heat in. That'll change the mechanical properties of the base metal and lead to cracking. So they're never going to let you weld anything greater than one half of an inch in a single bead. Uh, welding position. Well, you, you don't want to use a huge, humongous welding rod in, in some positions. Sure, you can get up to like a 3 16 but you aren't going to want to try to weld with, with a quarter-inch rod overhead. Uh, the amount of current, how much current are you going to use? And of course, here we come back again to the skill of the welder. As I've said before, some welders, some students are golden arms, some aren't. So it, uh, it depends a lot on your skill level. When you leave here, there's not a reason in the world you won't be able to weld with 332 and 8 inch welding rod in all positions. Uh, dropping down, okay, it says... Uh, the first pass of pipe welding and other bevel butt joints should be welded with 1 8 or 532 inch electrodes. This is necessary in order to obtain good fusion at the root and to avoid excessive melt through. The remaining passes may be welded with 532nd or 316th electrodes in all positions and 316th or larger in the flat position. That's usually done in downhill pipeline welding. And this would be weld uh, 25. 530 is, I believe, what we call it, but it starts, you would start learning this stuff in weld 1840. This is a butt joint. So you're going to want to weld that root pass with a, a 332 or an eighth inch, uh, or uh, I believe that says 532. And what you want to do is make sure you break down this bevel, tie everything in, and don't get any undercut on the back sides here. Okay? So that's the rod that you're going to use that. Once you have that in, then it's a solid steel all the way, and you can go to bigger electrodes then to finish it out. And that's what they're telling us there. And typically, as I say, uh, pipeliners will, will use the largest electrodes they can because they want to get the job done. You know, they're, they're, they're paid to get that job done, and a lot of companies will pay by the weld. But again, you've got to be careful. You don't turn it up too high. Don't turn your ambush up too high. Don't use too big an electrode because you can't exceed a certain amount of heat input into the weld because if you do, you'll be uh, uh, changing the mechanical properties and uh, having a detrimental effect on the weld. So go ahead and read down through the rest of these things. Uh, all these other reasons why uh, that, that will go into the decision what welding electrode you're going to use. Flip the page. It says job requirements. The requirements of the job are the basis for the proper selection of the electrode. And here they give us some more bulleted items. The skill of the welder. The code requirements the properties of the base metal, the position of the joint, and so forth. All of those things will influence the type of electrode that you're going to use. Um, operating characteristics of the electrodes. The nature of the materials that go into the covering of an electrode usually determine not only the physical and mechanical properties of the weld deposit, but also the operating characteristics of the electrode. Different electrodes require different welding techniques. 
Thus, electrodes may be grouped according to their operating characteristics and the requirements of the joints to be welded as either a fast fill, a fast follow, or a fast freeze. So that they, they say that welding rod can fall into one of those three categories. Um, a, fast, a fast fill would be like your 7024 rod. Because it's got 50% iron powder in that flux, it's going to deposit a greater amount of weld metal per inch of weld. So that would be a fast fill. A fast follow, let me read this, it says this group is also known as fill freeze electrodes. They have characteristics that in some degree combine both fast freeze and fast fill requirements. In making lap welds or light, uh, or light gauge sheet metal welds, little additional metal, weld metal is needed to form the weld. The most economical way to make the joint is to move rapidly, really fast, um, with uh, a shallow penetrating electrode. Or, and you might even want to go with DC electrode negative so that uh, you're not generating as much heat. Uh, because it is necessary to make the crater uh, follow the arc as rapidly as possible. And so the electrode is called a fast follow. 6012 and 6013. Uh, we're not going to get into welding with those, but those are some examples of the type of electrode you might use for that. A fast freeze. 7018 is an example of a fast freeze welding electrode. Uh, so is 6010. Uh, flip the page 356. Combination types. Some joints require the characteristics of both fast fill and fast freeze electrodes. When fast freeze is required, the best electrodes are the E6010, DC electrode positive, and so forth. Low hydrogen electrodes, read about this. It says, uh, low high electrodes, this is your 7018, are those that have coverings containing practically no hydrogen. Uh, they produce welds that are free from underbead and microcracking and have exceptional ductility. Remember, we talked about how uh, uh, ductility decreases as, as uh, um, tensile strength increases, but 7018 uh, would have greater ductility because it's a, whole, a low hydrogen electrode. Iron powder rods, your 7024, I've mentioned before, is one of your iron powder rods, so read about that. Then over the next column says type of base metal. The nature of the material to be welded is of prime importance. Satisfactory welds cannot be made if the weld metal deposited does not have the same physical and chemical qualities as the material being welded. Uh, all the welds that you do are going to be governed by a welding procedure specification, a WPS. What that is, it's a piece of paper that says you're going to use this welding rod to weld this type of material together using this, this amount of amperage and this amount of voltage. The main consideration is What's the base metal? Because whenever you make a weld, you have to use a filler rod, a, a, a welding electrode, that's going to match the chemical and mechanical properties of that base metal. That's what they're telling us here. That's what it's all about. And then you may have to tweak the welding procedure uh, for any special requirements. Uh, I've already mentioned the high carbon content. If it gets too high, then you're going to have to do some heat, some stress relieving afterwards. But it all starts with what kind of base metal is it? Is it aluminum? Is it stainless? Is, is it mild steel? That's going to change everything. We can't use carbon to weld aluminum, right? And we don't want to use carbon to weld stainless because it uh, doesn't have corrosion resistant properties. So it all starts with matching the filler metal to the base metal. Uh, go to the middle of this paragraph um, where it reads, the welder may be able to tell, for example, that the material is steel rather than cast iron. But there are so many types of alloy and stainless steels that it is necessary to know the correct analysis of the steel as designated by the manufacturer. The manufacturer will provide what's called an MTR, a mill test report. And on that mill test report, they'll break it down and tell you what all these percentages are. Just like we read back here on page 349, where we had carbon with 0.10%, manganese with 0.40%. An MTR will list what that base metal is. And you want to you match your filler metal to whatever that MTR says, or at least get, get as close as you can. The nature of current. Uh, welding machines produce two types of welding current, alternating current and direct current. Direct current can be either DC electrode negative or DC electrode positive. La-di-da, uh, la-di-da. Read about that. I've talked about current already in a, a couple of times. Uh, the thickness and shape of material to be welded. I'm on page five, uh, 358 now. 
Whether the material is of heavy gauge or light gauge partially determines the electrode size. As a general rule, never use an electrode having a diameter that is larger than the thickness of the material being welded. Well, that's a good rule. As a general rule, that works, okay. But uh, sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, in chilling metal arc welding, it, 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 it's, it's a pretty good applicable rule. But when you get into other types of welding, it, it, it doesn't always apply. Uh, joint design and fit up. There's five types of joints. I put them on the board uh, in a previous lecture. Uh, but the type of joint design is going to affect the electrode that you use. Uh, if you're doing a groove weld, you may want to use a different welding electrode than one that you might want to do with a fillet weld. Uh, you may want to use 7024 for fillet weld. But you don't want to use 7024 on a pipe weld, on a pipe groove weld. So that would have some some bearing on the, on the decision. Welding position is another one. Uh, the position of the welding is very important con consideration in the choice of an electrode. Certain types of electrodes can be used only in the flat position. Others perform equally well in all positions. The type of position also has an influence on the costs. And this should be a bullet because it, it usually comes up. Welding is most economical in the flat position. After that, then the horizontal and, and then the vertical. And the overhead position is the least economical. It's also considered to be the hardest, although some people would argue that the vertical position is the hardest. Put a bullet by this. The size of the electrode to be used is strongly influenced by the position of welding. V-butt joints in the vertical over and overhead positions are usually welded with a small diameter electrode in order to obtain complete penetration at the root of the weld. In multi-layer welding, the other passes can be made with larger electrodes. Welding in the vertical and overhead positions should never be attempted with an electrode larger than 3 16 of an inch. Okay, service conditions, conditions of use. This is very important. The service requirements are of the utmost importance. The type of structure and the stress that it will encounter uh, in use must be considered. We have a lot of different codes, API 1104 code, the ASME code, um, the American Wellness Society structural code. They're all written to cover different types of fabrication. AWS D1.1, which the book has referenced already, is a structural code for building, making buildings and bridges. Well, bridge building is D1.5, uh, but it's all designed for structural. API 1104 is designed to cover cross-country pipelines. Uh, you're going to make a weld in a pipe, you're going to bury it in the ground. It's going to have maybe 100 pounds of pressure in it. ASME is going to do power plants. Where, you're, where your wells are going to be exposed to high heat, extreme heat and high pressure inside those pipes. All different service conditions. And so the codes are different to account for those. And the type of welding electrodes that you're going to use can be different uh, to accommodate all those different uh, uh, service conditions. Um, so keep that in mind. Production efficiency on page 361. Go to the middle of, this, uh, of that column and put a bullet by the paragraph that reads, the principal factor in the cost of a welding job is the speed with which the welding can be done. Electrode cost is small by comparison. 7024 and 6027 electrodes permit the highest rate of deposition. 6010, 6012, 6013, 6011, and 6010 follow in that order. Uh, type of steel, not speed, should govern the choice of the 7015 or 7018. Uh, the 7028, remember that too, means flat or horizontal only, is similar to the 7018, but it has a much thicker coating that contains a higher percentage of iron powder. Thus, its deposition rate is much higher. So, uh, one of the principal factors involved uh, is, is how fast can the job be done. And that's what a, a, an owner is going to look at, is how fast, it, what, what is going to get the job done and still meet code requirements. Job conditions. Uh, is the material clean, rusty, painted, or greasy? What is the type of service treatment required for the finished job? Are you going to grind it? Are you going to machine it? Are you going to hit it with a hammer? Is the completed job to be stress relieved or heat treated? Are the welds in the prominent location so that weld appearance is important? Only a welder with thorough knowledge of electrode characteristics can answer these questions by choosing the best electrode for the job. You're your own best inspector. And as you go through these classes, you'll understand these things. And we're going to keep force feeding you all th this concept. You're the quality control person. 
governing the quality of your own work. But these particular things, does it have to have post-weld heat treatment or anything like that? That will be laid out in your MTR. That will be already specified for you. You won't have to make the decision, in most cases, of which electrode to use. It will already be done for you. Page 362, uh, summary of factors affecting the selection of the electrodes. Here everything is bulleted. Uh, read over that, those bullets so you get an idea of what factors would be uh, uh, considered. Specific electrode classifications. Now we're getting into the individual uh, electrodes. Read this entire section, but I'm, I'm going to read some things that I want you to highlight. Uh, heavily, cover, heavily covered mild steel shielded arc electrodes. E6010, this electrode is the best adapted of the shielded metal arc types for vertical and overhead welding. It is therefore the most widely used electrode for the welding of steel structures that cannot be readily positioned and w which require considerable multiple pass welding in the vertical and overhead positions. So, 6010, important electrode. Uh, middle of that column it says, the quality of the weld metal is of a high order and the specifications for this classification are score correspondingly rigid. The essential operating characteristics are, and then read all of these bulleted items. Uh, it produces really good weld metal consistently. Uh, it takes a bit of skill to be able to use this thing, especially on open butt welding. Um, but 6010 and 7018 are the two most common electrodes used in North America. That's the United States and Canada. Dropping down below those bulleted items, as I mentioned before, 6010 electrode is commonly classified as the cellulose type. The electrode coating contains considerable quantities of ce uh, cellulose, either in a treated form or as wood flour or other natural forms. During welding, the cellulose is changed to carbon dioxide and water vapor, forming the gaseous envelope that excludes the harmful oxygen and nitrogen in the air. So that's what breaks down in the heat of, uh, of welding to, and creates that shielding gas over the molten puddle so that atmospheric air can't get to it. Um, one last thing I want you to make note of on 6010. This type of cellulose electrode needs a certain amount of moisture present in its coating and should not be stored in a dry rod oven. If improperly stored, operating characteristics will be adversely affected. Some welded electrode has to be heat, uh, heat stabilized and kept in a rod oven, which we'll come to in a little, in a little bit. 6010 does it. Uh, actually, a little moisture does help it. And I have seen welders take it where it's dried out too much, and they'll actually put it in a bucket and pull it out and shake it off and let it set for a little while, and then they'll go ahead and use it uh, to add back some moisture to get those desirable weld quality properties. Uh, but 7018, you can't do that at all with that. Uh, 6011, read about that. Uh, it's pretty much like uh, 6010. But one thing I want to point out here, it says, although it may also be used with direct current electrode positive, it loses many of its beneficial characteristics with this polarity. Um, 6011 is an alternating current electrode. So you want to run that on AC. It's real similar to 60, 6010, but uh, that last digit, that one, tells you that it's an AC rod and not a DC rod. 6012, all position, alternating current, and DC electrode negative. This is a fill freeze type electrode. Read about that. Flipping the page, 6013. They call this hippie rod. All position, alternating current, and DCEN or DCEP. This is very common on pipelines. Read about that. 7024, all position, alternating current, and DCEN or DCEP. It's a fast fill type. Go ahead and read about that, and then we come over to the low hydrogen electrodes. Picking it up in the second paragraph, it says, the name stems from the fact that the coatings are free of minerals that contain hydrogen. The lack of hydrogen is an important characteristic because hydrogen causes underbeak cracking in high carbon and alloy steels. By eliminating hydrogen, underbead cracking is prevented, and difficult steels can be welded with little or no preheat. These electrodes also produce porosity-free welds in high sulfur steels and eliminate hot shortness in phosphorus-bearing steels. The addition of iron powder in the coating increases the deposition rate. Shielded metal arc welding electrodes that have a classification, and you should remember this, that end in 5, 6, or 8, 
are considered to be low hydrogen electrodes. Uh, these electrodes are low in hydrogen bearing compounds so that only traces of hydrogen and moisture are present in the arc atmosphere. The core contains from 0, 0, pardon me, 0 0.08 percent to 0.13 percent carbon. I'm not going to read all those different chemical uh, uh, amounts. The low hydrogen electro has a core of mild steel or low alloy. The mineral covering consists of alkaline earth carbonates and so forth. This covering produces the desired weld metal analysis and mechanical properties. 7018 and 7028 have iron powder in their coverings. Uh, during welding, the covering forms a carbon dioxide shield around the arc. On the job, these electrodes must not be exposed to humid air because their tendency to absorb a considerable amount of moisture. Um, all of these rods, they're what they, they're, they're, they're called friable. That is that they, the slag that's produced is it's easily crumbled. It pops off really easy, makes a really nice looking bead. You want to use a short arc. If you use a long arc, uh, you're running the risk of, it's highlighted here in your book, of hydrogen pickup. You can pick up hydrogen from the air, which would defeat the purpose of using a low hydrogen electrode. Uh, finish reading about that, and then read about 7015. Now they're going to talk about them, each one individually. Uh, 7015, 7016. The only difference between 7016 and 7015 is that 7016 is a, a alternating current, preferably alternating current. Read exclusively about, or, or uh, thoroughly about 7018 because you're using it and you're going to have some questions on it. Uh, I've already talked about the alloying elements uh, and, the, and the suffixes that can be added, such as A1 and B3 and so forth. 7028 ends in an 8, low hydrogen electrode, but now if you remember what we talked about earlier, that 2 means it's only designed to be used in the flat and horizontal positions. Uh, typically for fillet welds. You don't want to use it to, to fill a joint. Uh, 7048, now here's the first four that we've seen. Uh, it says here in, in, this, uh, in this bold face that it can be used overhead. Ah, uh, no. Four, I'd really like to know what they had in mind when they wrote, put that word in there, because four means it's a downhand rod. You can weld flat, uh, horizontal, but it's typically meant to be a vertical down rod. So this is a little confusing and hopefully you'll never come across it. And that's the first time I've ever seen a rod uh, actually designated with 70, uh, 48 uh, with that four. Uh, I've never used one. I don't know if, if your career will, will ever take you into that situation or not. Other covered electrodes, uh, 6020. Um, read a little bit about 6020, the essential operating characteristics of 6020. 7024, uh, you're going to be using that rod, so I would expect you to read that section thoroughly. Know about 7024. 7027, um, pay attention to the drag technique that it, that it mentions in, in, under 7027, and that will give you a brief outline of, of all of these electrodes. Again, focus on 6010, 7018, and 7024. When you get to page 368, skip the, the, the part on, on stainless steel and alloy electrodes and just keep flipping through until you come to page 376. Read about packing and protection of electrodes. Uh, packing, let me read from your book. Electrodes are always suitably packed, wrapped, boxed, or crated to protect against damage during shipment or storage as follows. You can have bundles up to 50 pounds, boxes from 25 to 50 pounds, or they can come in coils, reels, or spools of 200 pounds or less. And when you're talking about spooled stuff, that's probably something like the submerged arc that you see in our welding lab. Marking, they're always going to be marked. The, the container's always, always going to be marked. We know the welding electrodes are marked with the AWS identification system numbers. Uh, they're going to be marked as to the classification, who made them, that's the manufacturer, what size are they, and a guarantee. What, the guarantee is what's called a certificate of conformance. Remember that term, certificate of conformance. That, that is a guarantee from the manufacturer that they meet American Welding Society manufacturing standards. If it says it's got X amount of carbon in it, and X amount of sulfur in it, that's their guarantee that it does.
Uh, and then finally, this paragraph reads, the welder should always give careful attention to the manufacturer's recommendations concerning heat settings, type and preparation of joint, base metal, welding technique, welding position, and nature of the welding current. Any references to moisture control are also important. Sometimes you'll come across a welding rod that you haven't welded with before, but usually somewhere on the box that it came in, uh, the manufacturer will give you some tips on how to use it. Moisture control, let me pick some highlights out here. A perfectly dry electrode is the first requirement for a perfect welding job when their job requires low hydrogen electrodes or other moisture prone electrodes. Dropping down to the next paragraph, it says, all mineral covered electrodes are thirsty. The minute they are unpacked, they start absorbing moisture, too much moisture for a sound weld. Outside of a laboratory, it is impossible to tell when an electrode has absorbed enough moisture from the air to be unsafe. Electrodes, therefore, require anti-moisture protection. Electrode ovens. Electrode manufacturers recommend oven storage at specific holding temperatures to preserve and maintain factory baked in quality. Oven protection is not only recommended, but mandatory for the storage of low hydrogen uh, and hard facing electrodes. Uh, if you're going to be working in a cold situation, 7018 has to be kept in a rod oven once that box is open. I know in the welding lab, we don't have it, have it in, uh, in rod ovens, the stuff that you use every day. But if we were doing a test, then we do have a rod oven that we keep welding electrodes in. So if you're going to be doing a test and you're concerned that you might have some porosity, go ahead and get some rod out of our rod oven. And keep in mind that in a code situation, if you're doing a, a, a producing a code quality weld, it has to be, that welding rod has to be heat stabilized. I've done a lot of inspection and I busted up an awful lot of welding rod that a welder left out of a rod oven. And therefore, I don't know how long it was out of that rod oven. It can't be used on the job and it's got to be thrown away. So you always want to keep that, that rod control in mind when you're working. Um, the covering of low hydrogen electrodes, for example, Oh, this is interesting stuff here. The covering of low hydrogen electrodes, for example, is reduced to less than 0.2% at manufacture and the electrodes are packaged in moisture proof containers. Within two hours at 80% humidity, the electrodes may contain up to 13 times the allowable moisture content for U.S. government specifications. If it's left out for 24 hours, they may gain up to 26 times of the 0.2% allowed. So the longer it's left out, the more moisture it absorbs. Electro drying ovens have capacities varying from 12 to 1,000 pounds and temperature controls to 1,000 Fahrenheit. The smaller ovens are portable, making them convenient for shop or field welding. The larger ovens provide for central storage and baking for the entire shop. Uh, if you look at figure 1211 on page 378, that's the type of welding rod oven that we have. And incidentally, look at, look at table 1219 on page 378. Uh, if you find rod that's left out, uh, you can rebake it. There are rules applied that allow for rebaking. And uh, if you look at uh, the third column there, those are some rebaking, uh, rebaking things that you can do there. But the, the holding ovens, uh, if you look at the very bottom one, it says 250 to 300 degrees. That's typically where you want to keep your 7018. Uh, if you want to know specifically how long something has to be rebaked, I have that information for you. Okay, that is all of chapter 12. There will be a written test on this. There will mostly be multiple choice, true, false, uh, or fill in the blank. I think we've pretty well covered everything. If there's anything you didn't understand, get with Jeff Brager or myself, and we'll be happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one until it's clear in your mind what we, what we need. Thank you very much for your attention.